All right. Brother Carl, I'm just making sure you get enough reading in. <laughs> We're doing these real long chapters, John 1 and Luke 1, today in church. But hey, as I said this morning, you know, we're, we're focusing in on Jesus and what better chapters than John 1 and Luke 1 anyways to start with to just open up and, and be looking at Jesus Christ as our, um, our main topic here that we're looking to learn about and learn from. So in John 1, of course, I, I mentioned this already this morning that the, this evening's sermon I'm going to be talking about, you know, the, the series we're doing more about Jesus and, and the first portion of, of ser the first series of sermons are going to be regarding, you know, who Jesus is based on what he's referred to in the Bible, right? What he's called in the Bible. So this morning was Son of Man, Son of God. Those are both um, ways of identifying him that, that are very common throughout uh, the scripture. And then this evening, it's the Lamb of God. And I, all of these are extremely important. You know, I mean, these aren't just small nuance things you could find in scripture. These are, these are fundamental things about Jesus Christ that we're going over, especially in the first few sermons I'm going to be preaching uh, in this series. Again, this, this one is just massively, massively important. The fact that Jesus Christ is being referred to as the Lamb of God, essentially from the very beginning of his ministry, speaks volumes. This isn't something that he came, you know, a, a term or a name that he came to get like later on as he's performing his ministry. This is from the very, very beginning of his showing essentially unto Israel, right? Showing unto Israel, starting with John the Baptist, you know, preparing the way before the Lord. He's preaching in the wilderness. He's preaching and, and, and baptizing with the baptism of repentance and getting people ready for Jesus Christ to come on the scene. And he's already getting a following and, and getting people's attention through his hard preaching and his own preaching with authority. And, you know, the Bible says that among them that are born of women, there's not a greater than John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is a great man of God. I mean, a great preacher, right? Just doing just awesome things for the Lord. And essentially what we see here in John chapter 1 is him just... After, you know, this is after the baptism of Jesus Christ, but he's, he, he saw witness. So John, excuse me, was given by revelation, John the Baptist, that, you know, as he's baptizing, the person whom he sees the Spirit of God descend upon, that's the Christ. That was, his, that was how he was able to know and to be able to point people to Christ because he knew that that was going to happen through his ministry as he's out baptizing people. Well, when he baptized Jesus Christ, when they both went down into the water, both John and Jesus, and he baptized him and, and they came up again, the, the Spirit of God descended like a dove upon Jesus Christ. And John witnesses this. I mean, he, he literally sees it with his eyes. He sees the Spirit de descending upon Jesus Christ knowing this is the Christ. This is the Christ. This is who we were looking for. This is who, what my ministry was all about. And now that he's accomplished that goal, that end, the end of his ministry to, to be able to, you know, point people to Christ, now he's shifted in, in a sense, right? He's never, he's always been trying to, to point people to Christ, but now he knows who that is. Right? So he's still trying to lead people to Christ even before Jesus was identified as the Christ through his baptism. But now he knows who it is. And when we look down at verse number 29, the Bible says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. So right off the bat, he's saying, This is the Christ. This is the Lamb of God. And that term that he's using, the Lamb of God, Again, it's extremely important because we're going to go back. We're going to look at two instances for the Lamb of God. One is with Abraham before the law of Moses was even established. And then also in the law with the Passover lamb being representative of Jesus Christ himself. These are where we derive you know, the, all the meaning and importance behind the Lamb of God and Jesus being the Lamb of God. And how important these events were, especially that Passover lamb in the Old Testament, just carries through for, for millennia of people observing 
This sacrifice is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The lamb being sacrificed and Jesus embodying that lamb and being representative of that lamb to where, and we're not going to cover all the references in the New Testament where he is called, you know, the lamb of God. It's not just in, in John chapter 1. But we, I wanted to start reading here because that just the reference to the Lamb of God is 100% tied in with uh, he that takes away the sin of the world. Right? The, the, the sacrificial lamb was made for forgiveness of sins. It was made for deliverance. It was made for that, uh, that atonement. And we'll get into all that as we go through the actual scriptures regarding that. Verse number 30 says, This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, we know that John the Baptist was born physically in this world before Jesus Christ because Elizabeth was already with child when Mary conceived. Right? And, 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 you know, she was informed of that also, that, you know, that your cousin also is uh, with child, who is considered barren, right? Another miraculous birth, at least in the world's eyes. And that's, you know, it was still a physical conception with, with an actual father and mother. But um, it's still miraculous in the sense that she was barren. She didn't have any children and she was already past age. Yet was still able to give birth to John the Baptist, who was, who was used greatly of God. But why, so why does he say he was... Um, before me, because he's got, because he knows that this is Christ. He knows that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist knew all this before Jesus even really started teaching that he's the Son of God. He's the Christ. He's who they're looking for because he knew that the Son of God, you know, is God and that's who they're looking for in a Messiah. It's important not to look past this because I, I've heard, and I, and I can't remember specifically who teaches this, it may be the Jews or the Judaizers, the people who look to the Jews for all their answers on understanding Scripture, which, by the way, don't go to the Jews to understand Scripture. Okay, don't think you could get some extra meaning behind what the Bible says. Oh, but let's go and, and, and read up on what the rabbis say and go talk to these guys and see, well, what do they think and what have they historically thought about Jesus Christ or about the Messiah and see how we can fit that in or what extra understanding. Look, they're going to steer you the wrong way. They didn't accept Christ when he came. What makes you think they have anything right about how the tradition should have been Regardless of what they did, even if some of the things they did, they still know to this day it doesn't matter because they didn't accept Christ. If they're not accepting Christ today, don't worry about getting insight from them because they rejected Jesus Christ. And where I was starting to go with this about John even understanding that he was before me, people will say, oh, this concept, this teaching of Jesus being the Son of God, like, that nobody knew anything about that, that the Jews weren't looking for a Christ that was God in the flesh. Because people will always try to attack the scripture in many different fronts. And they'll say, well, they, they weren't even looking for a son of God to be the Christ. They were just looking for a great leader. Well, that's what the Jews are looking for today. They're not looking for God in the flesh. They're looking for just another, just some great leader, some great teacher, kind of like, Muslim religion that we were just talking about this morning that looks to Abraham, they look to Jesus, they look to all these other figures, right? Well, the Jews are very similar. They look to Abraham, they look to Moses, they, you know, obviously they don't believe what was written because if they believe Moses, they believe Jesus and they reject Jesus. So we don't want to be going to them for any of our understanding on anything in scripture unless you just want to know what's wrong. You want to know what's wrong? Go ask some Christ-rejecting Jew. And you'll get the wrong answer. But I don't know what good that's going to do you. Even something, just, just this, this small verse, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Before all the teachings of Jesus, he knew this. He didn't need to hear Jesus say that he's the Son of God. He didn't need to hear that. He already knew that. And he knew that from, at least from his own revelation, that that um, he was going to be baptizing the Son of God. And having this great understanding that he's the Messiah, he's the Christ. 
He's the Lamb of God. Verse number 31, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, am I come baptizing with water. So he's saying, I didn't know. Not, he didn't say like, obviously he knew him because he's his cousin, but he didn't know up until the time when he baptized him that he was actually the Christ, that he was the one. I, he's, I knew him not, but in order to make him manifest to all Israel, that's what he was doing in his ministry. That's why he was doing his baptism. He says, therefore, I come baptizing with water. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I've been baptizing people so I could say, hey, this is him. This is the Christ. He's the one. Jump down to verse 35. Again, the next day after John stood, excuse me, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. So at this point in his ministry, now he, since he knows who it is, he's just saying, Hey, there's the Lamb of God. You know, I'm not the Lamb of God. I came doing my job. I came baptizing. Obviously, he's still going to preach the truth and preach God's word and preach the Bible, but he's saying, hey, there's the Lamb of God, right? You're here with me. Behold the Lamb of God. And he was pointing people to Jesus' ministry because Jesus is the Savior. I mean, wouldn't you do the same? <laughs> You'd be like, hey, I'm going to preach God's word. I'm going to do what I can. But like, if Jesus were here, he'd be like, hey, there's Jesus. Or follow him. This is what I'm preaching about. This is, you know, there you go. He's right there. Follow him. And this is exactly what John the Baptist was doing. And, and he had the right spirit and the right attitude. He wasn't in it for himself. And he says, behold, I'm, uh, he must increase, but I must decrease. Right? It's, it's about him. It's not about me. But twice here we see him just referring, just he's looking at Jesus saying, that's the Lamb of God. So why is he calling him the Lamb of God? Turn if you go to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. I'm going to try to cover as much of the symbolism as possible in these stories because they're all relevant to Jesus Christ and who he is and, and everything that he did lines up with the stories that are given to us or these, these uh, you know, the sacrifices that were made. So we're going to see in Genesis chapter 22, we're going to start reading verse number one, the Bible reads, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So now, I mean, this would be a hard request. Abraham, if you remember the story of Abraham, that Isaac was a child of promise. God promised Abraham. He promised that his descent, you know, he made this promise on his descendants. I'm going to make your seed as a sand by the seashore, as the stars innumerable, you know, so shall thy seed be. And that this, this came to pass when he was past age, when he's 100 years old and Sarah's 90 years old, that Isaac's born unto him. So this, this long-awaited child that he's been waiting for, that God promised him, you know, she, he, he's been raising and rearing and loves, I mean, of course he loves his son, right? He loves his son. There's, there's so much involved in that relationship there. And now God's testing him. That's what it means to tempt him. Saying, okay, now I want you to offer Isaac, whom thou lovest, for a burnt offering in the mountain. So uh, verse number three, Abraham was obedient unto that request by the Lord, or the command by the Lord, saying, this is what I want you to do. And of course, this is representative of God the Father sacrificing His only begotten Son, right? His beloved, well-beloved Son that He loves so much, being willing to offer that sacrifice for us. Jesus Christ being that offering. Verse number three, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. 
And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now, you can't overlook any of these words, and, and I'm, I'm skipping over some things that, that I'm sure are still symbolic. I'm just not going to get into every last detail. And to be honest with you, I probably don't even know every last detail of where all the different um, applications you could make on this uh, that are fulfilled. But let's, um, I don't want to skip past this one because this is also mentioned in Hebrews 11 that, that basically when God was asking him to go and sacrifice his son, Abraham already knew the gospel. The Bible says that the gospel was preached before unto Abraham. And this, is, you know, this isn't before Abraham's salvation, okay, when Abraham's well over 100 years old. He's already saved. He knows the gospel. He knows the plan of salvation. And having that faith, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, that, that he knew that God was able to raise up his son even from the dead. That if God's asking him to do this, God's not asking him to murder his son. And this is what, you know, people who hate God and hate the Bible and just want to mock the Bible will, will try to liken this story to some lunatic full, you know, possessed with devils. Oh, well, what if, what if this guy just says, well, I hear from God and he, God told me to kill people and this is what, you know, they try to make this out to look like that type of a scenario, which it's the farthest thing from that scenario you could possibly get. And, and bastardizing this story about the love of God and the great sacrifice that he made for humankind into some lunatic that just wants to murder somebody. But he knows, he tells his servants, he says, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. He's fully expecting him and Isaac to return back to the servants. He said, you guys stay here. We're going to go do the sacrifice and then we're both coming back. So just, just wait for us here. Because he was never thinking that God's just going to take away his son. And you know what? He knew that he wasn't anyways, also because of the promise. Because Isaac was the child of promise. Isaac didn't have any descendants yet. So how could God keep his promise of being blessed with all, the, you know, with, with all that seed if the seed of promise, which he said this is the child of promise to him before, before he was born and then after he was born and maintaining that saying, this is the child of promise. It's in Isaac shall thy seed be called. How could he possibly fulfill any of that if he was just going to kill him and then he was just going to be gone? He had to know. And he had the faith to know that what God says is true and it's going to come to pass. And that there's no way that he could just completely separate him from Isaac. And since he already knew the gospel, he, he had to have at, at some level an understanding that God is going to show his might. God is going to show his power through a resurrection of his son. Because that's what he had hope in ultimately in the Lord Jesus Christ, even though he didn't know him by name. The, the Lord Jesus. He didn't know the name of Jesus, but he knew the gospel. And I'll tell you this much, you know what? We don't believe in dispensationalism here. The gospel is the same. There's an everlasting gospel that hasn't changed. The good news of the truth, the, the good news of Jesus Christ, of a Messiah, of a Christ, just like we saw in, in the gospels, you see in the gospels, the Jews are looking for a Christ. They're looking for a Messiah. They're looking for a Savior because they know that there's going to be a Savior. It's not just something that just blindsides. Oh, wait, there's a Savior? What? Just like Jesus rebuked Nicodemus. Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? You don't know what being born again is? You have no idea what, what I'm talking about here? It's always been the same. Abraham knew that there was no way that God was going to just take Isaac from him here. So he's going to act out what it is that God's telling him to do. And you know what? It is here for a reason. The Bible says in um, verse number six, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. 
So here we see Isaac carrying the wood that he's going to use for the burnt offering. He's going to use for the sacrifice the picture of Jesus Christ bearing his own cross that's made of wood that he's carrying to Golgotha. That he's going to Calvary and he's, and he's, he's you know, carrying his own cross. We see here Isaac's carrying this wood. He lays this wood upon him and it says, um, and he took fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? So Isaac's kind of going, well, what, what's going on here, <laughs> right? We've got, we've got the wood, we've got the fire. I know we're going. So this isn't some new thing of making a sacrifice to the Lord. Obviously, it's something they've been doing. And what was the offering that they would make to the Lord? A lamb. So now he's looking for a lamb. Where's, where's the lamb? This is prior to the law of Moses. Yet it was still well known that a lamb sacrifice was given to the Lord. Now, you say, well, how can that be? Well, there's, there's a few ways how that can be. One is God's word is eternal. Okay, God's word is eternal. We don't know the extent of the knowledge that people who believed on the Lord and, and trusted in the Lord and worshiped the Lord, we don't know the extent of the knowledge they had on things that are written in Scripture that we can look back on and things that were written down. Because while we're not dispensationalists, things were different in the sense of the communication between God and man. For example, when God created Adam and Eve, he would speak with them, right? Like they, they could audibly hear the Lord. And he would have this communication with the people that, that ends up changing. And we know that, um, you know, Moses... Is, is regarded as the author of Genesis through, through um, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy to um, the first five books of the Bible as the, the written record of all these events in history. But it's not that, well, prior to then, people just didn't know anything about God. God was, was dealing with Abraham personally, right, and making himself known. So we don't know to what extent and what knowledge was given to these people. The Word of God doesn't change, but obviously he knew about lamb sacrifices just as much as we know even going back to Cain and Abel, even though it's not written down, Cain's sacrifice was not accepted, but Abel's was. And Abel, going way back, I mean, going back to the beginning, what did he do? He offered up an animal sacrifice to the Lord and that was acceptable whereas Cain brought the work you know the works of his own hands the fruit of the ground as his sat offering and his sacrifice to the Lord and that was unacceptable and God let him know that and there's no way that that God's just going to say well this isn't acceptable with me and it, you know without first having had let him know right what's the acceptable offering right it wouldn't make any sense to just get upset with someone without you never even told me that so and I don't want to get too far off on that tangent, but seeing this and, and, and understanding, the reason why I'm bringing it up is because the, the Lamb of God is so central to what Jesus did when he came to this earth and who he was and the identity of Jesus is, is centrally tied into being the Lamb of God. Going all the way back to Genesis and going all the way through to Revelation, which I had Revelation in my notes, but I'm, I'm not going to get there for sake of time just because there's so much in these passages I want to go over that Jesus is referred to as a lamb multiple times in Revelation as well. But let's keep reading here. Um, so as Isaac's looking for, well, where's the lamb? Verse 8 says, And Abraham said, My, God, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And that's a, that's a powerful verse again right there. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering, which is exactly what he did. He provided himself as the lamb for the burnt offering. Jesus Christ was, is that lamb of God. 
who's being pictured here, who's being represented. But Abraham knew this. This isn't complicated doctrine. This isn't foreign or strange doctrine. This is foundational, fundamental doctrine. Verse number nine. Uh, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So he's ready to just act out this whole thing. And, and Isaac is bound, right? He's, he's tied up. Uh, Jesus was bound when he went to, you know, when he was brought back and forth. He's basically arrested and, and brought before um, Pilate. Definitely not free. And, um, and led away to be, to be executed. And it says here, so Abraham's ready. He's got his knife ready to slay his son. Verse 11, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. You say, now I know what's in your heart. I know, I know that, you know, where your faith is because you haven't even held back in, in an area where, you know, it, it may be very hard to try to follow through on your faith by, by doing this, even though God's commanding you to, just still being able to do it. And sometimes, you know, when we don't understand the Word of God, just having that faith and following what God is commanding is, you know, what we just need to do. The Bible says, uh, verse number 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And even that picture there of a ram getting caught in a thicket or in, you know, in some thorns and some bramble is symbolic of that crown of thorns that Jesus Christ wore on his head, you know, when they were mocking him and they, they, they put that, that crown of thorns on his head and it says, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And again, this now, this is that replacement this is what Jesus did for us. If Isaac represents all of us deserving to be burnt, right? Deserving to be burnt with fire for our own sins. Well, now we have, hey, look, God's provided this sacrifice. Here it is. Now you don't have to burn. This will take the place for you. And that redemption and that salvation of Isaac in this situation is symbolic of us. That, that Jesus Christ being that lamb. Hey, we don't, you don't have to burn now because there's a, new, there's a sacrifice that's acceptable unto God and well-pleasing unto God that's available. And Jesus Christ embodies that as well, that, that sacrifice. Now, let's go to the next um, illustration in the scripture in Exodus chapter 12 of Jesus being the Lamb of God. So there's that story right there. And both of these have to do with just be, with a sacrifice, right? And every sacrifice that you look at in the Old Testament, there's a lot of different types of sacrifices and different rules on, on how the sacrifice would be performed. They all have their own um, correlation or symbolism with Jesus Christ. They all, in, in, in their own way. But the main sacrifice, the big sacrifice, the focal point of all the sacrifices in the Old Testament is the Passover lamb. I mean, by far, I would say the, this, is, this is the biggest thing. When people would, you know, you look back through the, the, the reign of the kings of Israel and of all the feasts, of all the holy days, of everything that they would do, you know, when they were getting right with God, when Hezekiah is getting the people of Israel right with God, when um, Joash is getting the people right with God, what did they do? They held a great Passover. 
that was the, the time that they chose to be like, hey, we're really going to serve the Lord now. We're going we're gonna to get things right. We're going to hold this great Passover and everyone's going to get right with God and we're going to hold this great feast and this great com uh, commemoration of the pa that That is kind of the, the focal point of all of the sacrifices is this Passover lamb. And we're going to see here as we read through Exodus chapter 12 how like everything lines up just perfectly with Jesus Christ being that Passover lamb, not, uh, and of course, it's being called the Lamb of God. Not to mention Jesus Christ being called our Passover. We're going to look at that verse as well. Uh, Exodus chapter 12, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, The Passover lamb, as we're going to see here, is representative on a grand scale of the children of Israel being delivered out of bondage. Right? So even just the whole notion and the whole concept of having this Passover lamb, it's at a time when God is delivering them out of Egypt. It's the last plague, right? The very last plague on Egypt was the death of the firstborn son throughout all the land. And the lamb was slain in order to put the blood on the doorpost, which we'll get into more of that symbolism, which is you know, pretty obvious anyways, on their house so that they wouldn't suffer death. They wouldn't have that death angel come and kill the firstborn in that house because the blood covered the house. And it was after that night that Pharaoh just, they, they were just expelled. They're just like, go, right? And then they leave, which finally is that release of the bondage of, of Egypt, where they were slaves, where they were oppressed. Now they have their liberty after that night of the Passover lamb. So on a, on a big scale, Egypt represents the world and the bondage is what sin brings you into in the world. You're in the bondage of sin. But after you have Jesus, after the Lamb of God is applied to you, to your heart, to the door of your heart, you receive liberty. You receive freedom. There's liberty in Christ. There's freedom from that penalty of sin, of being oppressed and being in slavery to that sin, now you're free, and now you, you're free to, to let God lead you as he will. And that's the big, that's the, the big scale, and it's, it's, it's at that moment, literally in history, of that Passover lamb sacrifice being, being made. And because it's such a pivotal, pivotal moment, God changes our calendar and says, this is the first month of the year to you. Like, we're starting things now. This is the first month the month of your deliverance, so that every year now when you start off, you're starting off with this deliverance, with this freedom. And of course, institutes the commemoration by having the Passover lamb sacrifice and stuff. And we're going to go through this now and look at all the details surrounding this sacrifice that gets added to or is, is part of the law that God gave to Moses. Now he's saying, you're going to do this every year because I don't want anyone forgetting about this and how important this event is when God had that strong arm and brought the children of Israel out and made them free. So verse 2 again says, The month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And you can go on, even on the days of this. I've, I've done this before, but like the 10th day and then the 14th day we sacrifice. And you can apply this to Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and, and everything that goes on in the Gospels. We're not going to do that. We're not going to dive that deep today because I just want to cover all the, the symbolism. But there's so much to this. There's so much to this that can be applied even in everything that Jesus did right before his crucifixion.
that lines up perfectly with all of the details here. So I'm going to try to hit as many as possible. Like I said, there's more that I'm not going into just because it takes a while to do that Bible study of, of lining up every single scripture. But it's a great study to do on your own and just kind of uh, get all the Gospels together in order and, and figure out the days. Um, it's really, really interesting. Um, so it's in the 10th day, verse number 3, in the 10th day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. And what's, what's, what's going on here is obviously if you have just like one person in a house or something, they're not going to eat a whole lamb themselves. So you're going to join up maybe with a couple of houses just according to what makes sense for the eating. Okay, yeah, we've got this lamb and it's going to provide for this many people. So let's coordinate and, and eat together so we could um, have this lamb be sufficient for everyone. And part of that is, you know, Jesus Christ is sufficient for everyone. Amen. And there's, you know, there's, there should be no lacking, nothing left over. It's exactly what you need. Which is exactly what God did with, uh, with the manna in the wilderness, by the way, which is also representative of Jesus being the bread of life and being that bread from heaven where no matter how much people gathered or didn't gather, like everybody had enough. Yeah. Completely satisfied, 100% sufficient with what they needed. And this is a, a similar thing where, okay, we've got two houses together, one house together, whatever, and there's just enough for you to be able to uh, be satisfied with that lamb. Um, verse number five. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Obviously important. So they, they were supposed to inspect the lamb. There's other offerings where, like the tithe, it's just you don't exchange a good for a bad or a bad for a good. He's just saying, just give me the tenth, give me the tenth, give me the tenth. You just go through, you know, your increase for the year or whatever and, and, and just you're not, you don't have to evaluate it. But the Passover lamb, you do have to evaluate. Yeah. It has to pass muster. It has, it has to be the right sacrifice because this one is symbolic and representative of the lamb of God that's to come to take away the sins of the whole world. Right. So in order for this to be the best representation of the Savior, you need to look at it a little bit more closely than some of the other sacrifices that you might make. This one has to be without blemish. You can't have some lame uh, lamb, right? It can't have some broken bone. It can't have some other problem with it, right? It's got to be perfect. There's got to be no blemish in it, just as Jesus Christ was perfectly sinless. There's no blemish in him. He didn't have any problems. So Jesus Christ was, was without sin 100%. A male of the first year, okay, yeah, we know Jesus Christ was a male. You shall take it out from the sheep, or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And this is where I was talking about Jesus entering into Jerusalem, you know, on the 10th day, and then the 14th day uh, sacrifices a Passover lamb, and, and that observation there, making sure you've got a lamb without blemish, and this is the, the you know, excuse me, the one to sacrifice. It says, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. The whole assembly of the congregation... Obviously, they didn't all gather together to kill one lamb, but it's saying the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill you know, their lamb. But I love the way that it's worded here because it sounds like it's one lamb on purpose because it's representative of all the people of Israel when he came unto his own and his own received him not. The representation of all the children of Israel saying, crucify him, crucify him. And that played out exactly as well. The assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Verse 7, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. And again, uh, the blood is huge, right? Jesus Christ bled on the cross. And not just that, when they're doing the motions of putting the the blood on the doorposts and on and on the, the over the head, it, you're, you're doing an emotion of a cross, which is what Jesus was was crucified on on a cross on the two side posts and in the upper doorpost of the house. Uh, verse number eight, and they shall eat 
the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and bitter with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Now, I'm going to go over the unleavened bread and bitter herbs a little bit later because there's another reference to that. So I'm not going to cover that right now. But even just eating the flesh, you know, Jesus Christ said that, that he was the, the bread of God. And if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And we're not talking about transubstantiation. We're talking about, you know, the symbolism there because he's the Lamb of God. So they make the sacrifice. They're supposed to eat of it. And it says, verse 9 is also just extremely important. I don't understand. People who don't believe the doctrine that Jesus Christ went to hell and suffered in hell, I should say suffered in hell, this makes no sense. Now, up to this point, is anyone having a problem seeing how just phenomenally Jesus Christ is representative of this, you know, the Passover lamb is representative of Jesus Christ. Are we really lacking in any area? Is there any other sacrifice that gives just, that doesn't just say there's a burnt offering, but now adds this extra verbiage to just make really clear, like it does in verse 9, eat not of it raw, nor sodden it all with water, but roast with fire. It said in the previous verse, roast with fire, but now it's just making sure that you understand, hey, look, do not eat it raw. Do not sod it with water. Do not, ro but, but it has to be roast with fire. His head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. So it has to be roast with fire. No other sacrifice goes into this much concern of making sure you understand this. If you're going to eat this, you cannot eat it raw. You can't, there, there cannot be water used to boil it or anything. It has to be roast with fire. Why is that? I wonder why that is. Why is it so important that we understand that the lamb sacrifice is roast with fire? And the roasting with fire is after the shedding of blood. Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross. Of course he did. Now that's critical for our salvation. Because it's the blood that washes us from our sins. Amen. But in order for this Passover lamb to be acceptable, you had to follow everything about this sacrifice. And with Jesus Christ being offered, being crucified on the cross, guess what? Every aspect of that had to be done appropriately and accurately as well all the way up to the point where Jesus sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. Which I wholeheartedly believe he did. You know, so people say, oh, what about when he said it is finished, it is finished. Of course he said that. But just because he said it is finished, you, know, you can't just go and apply the meaning and say, well, you're wrong because he said it is finished. Well, what is finished? Yeah. It. Yeah. So I'm going to say it means something. You're going to say it means something else. Prove it to me that it means that he didn't suffer in hell. Prove that to me. Yeah. Well, you said it is fi what is finished. Yeah. I say it means his earthly ministry was finished. Yeah. Because every prophecy of the scripture that he had any control over at all by his actions and by his words and everything that he said and everything that he did, all the way up to the point where he gave up the ghost, he completed in scripture. That whole portion of his earthly ministry was finished. And that's why he gave up the ghost. It makes sense to me. That's not some heretical teaching. Oh man, I can't believe you would say that's what he means when he says it is finished. Whereas other people say, well, no, everything that had to happen for your salvation happened and that's why he said it is finished. Well, really? Because did he rise again from the dead yet? Did the resurrection even happen? Amen. Preach it. Or the people that want to say, well, I mean, there's only one verse that says anything where you could possibly think that Jesus Christ suffered in hell. Maybe two. Yeah, how about Exodus 12? How about the fact that Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb? How about the fact that verse number 8, 
really goes into detail making sure that you don't do anything other than roast it with fire. Why is that so important? Why? Why would that be so important? It's not because your sin, you know, well, your sins is punished by hell, so uh, you have to roast the lamb, but it's the lamb that's getting roasted with fire. This proves my point. Anyways, I'm going to move on from that. Verse number 10, And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, look at this, you shall burn with fire. And it needs to be, you know, you need to eat it, right? Eating the lamb. And then whatever is not eaten, the rest of it has to be burnt with fire. All of it. So that there's nothing left. Verse 11. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon, upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Again, that important reference to the blood of Christ, the blood of the Lamb covering you, protecting you, saving you from that destruction. The, the, the roasting needed to happen because that's the way that God planned it. All of that had to happen just as much as, you know, you could have roast the Lamb with fire, but if you didn't put the blood over your doorpost, guess what? It wasn't acceptable. The blood shall be for you a token upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Which, by the way, I'll probably go into this a little bit when it gets a little bit closer to Easter and we observe the Lord's Supper. But the Lord's Supper is just a continuation, a, a slight a change because we're not offering animal sacrifices anymore because that would be blasphemous to, to do that when Jesus Christ is the lamb that's slain. And, and, and the sacrifice was used to let people know of the coming one, of the, of the coming Lamb of God that's going to take away the sins of the world. But once that's happened, now we no longer do that lamb sacrifice. However, the unleavened bread, like, he, like Jesus then partook of with the wine with his disciples at the Last Supper, uh, which also happened at Passover, demonstrates the shift or the change after the, the death of the lamb, finally, the once and for all, the, that, that final sacrifice being made, now to commemorate that death afterwards. So prior to the death, we showed the coming of the death of the lamb by offering up that lamb sacrifice under the Levitical priesthood. But now that Jesus Christ has done that, the commemoration of what he did is still important. It's still extremely important. I mean, it was important back then, it's important now. You know, when, when we practice, you know, holding communion with the Lord, when, when, we, when we partake of the, bread, of the body and blood of Christ, they're both representative of the same thing, of that shed blood, of the sacrifice that was made. It's just how do we observe that now? Which is why when we, and just for those of you that may not know, that's why when we observe the Lord's Supper, it's the Wednesday before Easter, which, which you know, the Easter symbolizes, is representative of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what, we, that's what we're, we're celebrating then. And that Wednesday would be the closest day that we can get to of when Jesus would have been holding that Last Supper, the Passover with his disciples. So 
that's what we're doing there. And again, I, I'll probably preach a little bit more in depth on that when it comes closer to that time. But this all pertains to the same thing. So let's see. Okay, I finish Exodus chapter 12. Turn if you would to Numbers, Numbers chapter 9. There's, just a, there's a few more things I just want to dig into here before we finish. That's the meat of the Passover right there, all the ordinances there regarding the Passover offering. So that salvation that the children of God received as a result of the Passover lamb being slain and the blood being applied, that's what Jesus did for us. And you need to apply the blood of Jesus to you in order to, be, to have your sins remitted, in order for the destroyer not to destroy you when you breathe your last breath. You'll see that blood applied to your account and pass over. No destruction for you. Numbers chapter 9, verse number 10, the Bible reads, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you or of your posterity shall be unclean, by reason of a dead body or being a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord. So in this, we're getting just a few more details now that wasn't included in Exodus because this, like this question came up, well, what do we do? Because the other sacrifices, you had to be clean. In order to be part of, partake in those sacrifices, you had to be clean. And, and there was different things that can make a person unclean. And the Bible, you know, God teaches like, hey, if you're unclean, no. You can't, you can't do that sacrifice. You, you, can't have, you can't participate in this because you're unclean. And even if you know, a relative, you know, a loved one dies and you handle that person because you have to. I mean, they, they died and you're going you're gonna to move them. You're going you're gonna to do something with them, with their body. You're unclean until the evening. And all the other sacrifices, no, you can't do that. But what's interesting about the Passover is that the focus on this isn't on you at all. It's all on the lamb. So all of the details are on the, the lamb has to be without blemish. The lamb has to be perfect. The lamb is the one that you're inspecting. And in this situation, because it's such an important sacrifice, God says, well, even if you're unclean for these reasons, you can still partake. I mean, and if you think about it, you know, symbolically, we're all unclean. We need that Passover lamb. We need to be able to partake in that offering. We need to be able to partake in that even though we're unclean. We need it. And in this particular offering, God allows this. It says, if any man of you, verse 10 again, uh, or of your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord. The 14th day of the second month at even, they shall keep it, keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it unto the morning, nor break any bone of it. And again, we didn't see that. Uh, we saw without blemish, but here even more specifically saying, not break a bone. Which, when you read the account of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he didn't break, none of his bones were broken. They might have been out of joint, but none of them were broken. And they even broke the legs of the other two malefactors that were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they pierced his side. They didn't break a bone because he needed to fulfill this, this being the, the Lamb of God. Right? And God knew that. So I'm sure God had something to do with them you know, not doing that to him and realizing that he was... Because the other two guys, I don't think, were dead yet, which is why they did that too. They're trying to kind of speed things up. When, you know, they couldn't leave him just hanging up on the cross. So they're, they're trying to get that, that done. And with Jesus, oh, we don't have to do this because he's already dead. So they just kind of made sure when they when they pierced him, and, uh, and that was the case. So it says here for the, the Passover lamb, not to break any bone of it. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. But the man that is clean and is not in a journey and forbeareth to keep the Passover. So now it's saying, you know what? This person has no excuse. They're here. They're not off on a journey. They're clean. Everything's fine. If they don't keep the Passover, it says even the same soul shall be cut off from among his people because he brought not the offering of the Lord in his appointed season, that man shall bear his sin. So you don't want to partake in having the blood of the lamb applied to you? You're going to bear your own sin. Good luck with that. 
Verse 14, and I love this verse too. And if a stranger shall sojourn among you and will keep the Passover unto the Lord, and it says will keep, it means they want to keep the Passover unto the Lord. A stranger, a foreigner is what that means. Some foreigner comes in to the land of Israel and they want to keep the Passover. It says, according to the ordinance of the Passover and according to the manner thereof, so shall he do. You should have one ordinance, both for the stranger and for him that was born in the land. This isn't just for the genealogy of the Jews. This is for anyone who wants to. Amen. Yea, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. Whosoever will can have the Passover lamb applied to them. I mean, this is going back to the book of Numbers. God's not a racist. God wants people of all nations to be saved and to come to him. The Passover lamb Jesus Christ shed his blood for all nations, for everybody to be able to be saved and come to him. Deuteronomy 16, we're almost done. This is, this is the part that I was talking about where I said we were going to cover the unleavened bread aspect of, of the offering because there's a little bit more detail here. In Deuteronomy 16. Now, just in general, you'll notice... When you're reading the Bible and there's references to leaven, leaven is symbolic of sin in the scripture. And how, you know, a little leaven leavens a whole lump, and you know, that sin will just kind of spread if you don't if you don't take care of it. Excuse me. But which is also the case here, but we're also gonna see um, just more specifically the Bible telling us more of what it means, which is why I wanted to turn to Deuteronomy 16, instead of inferring more of what the unleavened bread means, this tells us more specifically exactly what, what it's for. So look at verse number three. The Bible says, Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy, of thy life. So in the Passover sacrifice, that unleavened bread um, that they would have to eat for those seven days, it's, it was also to demonstrate this is bread of affliction. They didn't have time, you know, uh, to, to leaven and do all this other stuff with the bread that they, they had to just be ready to go. And when the time was come, they, just, they had to just go and, and do it. So, the remembrance is of that, um, that call to just go, to just be ready and go and do, and, and, not, um, and, and not have the, you know, just be ready, right? Be prepared. Be prepared against the day of the Lord. So um, it's, the, you know, it's called the bread of affliction here. Verse number four, let's continue reading here. It says, And there shall be no leavened bread seen with thee in all thy coasts seven days, neither shall there anything of the flesh which thou sacrificest the first day at even remain all night until the morning. Thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee, but at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in, there thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at even at the going down of the sun, at the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt. So one last point here in these verses is that the place also matters. And, he's, and this, is, this is showing us, you know, Jesus Christ was sacrificed outside of the gates of the city. So when he, was, when, when he was crucified, it wasn't in the city. So here it says that the, the, thou mayest not sacrifice a Passover within any of thy gates. Showing that his crucifixion was going to take place outside of the gates of the city. And um, it's going to be at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in. Um, all of these things were important parts of the sacrifice. So if you go to 1 Corinthians 5, last place we're going to look. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. All of these things were important. All of these details are representative. And like I said, I didn't cover all of them. I know There's no way I could cover all of them especially in a short time, we're already at about an hour into the sermon. There's so much here with the symbolism of Jesus Christ being that Lamb of God.
In 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 7, the Bible reads, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now, in the context here of 1 Corinthians 5, it's talking about fornication, right, and sin, right? So this is where I was talking about, again, with this leaven. Obviously, you know, the unleavened bread is, is representative of the body of Christ because he is sinless. But the Bible is teaching us here, you know, purge out that old leaven because you are unleavened. Because you've been saved, because, you know, as that new man has no sin. You're, you're born again. You're a creation of God. So purge out that old leaven. Don't walk in that anymore because Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Verse number 8, let, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And basically it's saying, you know what, put on the new man. We're going to hold this feast. We're going to commemorate the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's put on that new man. Forget that old sin nature. Forget that old man. Leave him sacrificed at the door and go, go forth now walking in newness of life. And you know what? You might have to eat that bread of affliction. You might not have all of the same luxuries or whatever that you might have had back in Egypt. The leeks and the onions and the garlic and the cucumbers and the melons. Remember all that? That the children of Israel were lusting after when they were out in the wilderness? You might, not, you might just have to eat the bread of affliction. But you know what? Walk in that newness and not in that old leaven and definitely not the old leaven of, of malice and wickedness. Let's put those things off. And, and walk in the, with the bread of sincerity and truth. That's pure. The unleavened bread is pure, right? Sincerity, truth, um, looking to Christ, our Passover. So there's so much to the Lamb of God. And like I said, those are only two places. You can look in Revelation. You can look at other references to Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God. But it's central to who Jesus was um, coming to this earth to be that lamb sacrifice in order to make that, that atonement for our sins and to pay the price. And you can look at every single aspect and detail of that and how the lamb of the Old Testament represents, is representative, or Jesus is representative of those lambs. Spirites have a word of, pray, uh, a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you made for us, for loving us enough to, um, to allow for your son to be sacrificed, the, the lamb of God, to, to take away the sin of the world. Lord, help us to point other people to, uh, to Jesus, to help us to point other people to that Lamb of God that we would, and, and that we would all maintain that focus on the Lamb and not get caught up in any one person or personality or anything, Lord, but that we would all stay focused on you and that we could all serve you together here in unison, in unison of spirit and um, in, in unison as, as a church body, Lord, with Christ at our head, uh, looking to serve him. And, and God, we just ask for your blessing. We thank you for loving us enough for, for that great sacrifice you made, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.